back to another impact tonight. I did pack education leadership. This is episode 168. I'm your host, ID3 for Isaiah Drone the third. Tonight's panelist is Buddy Thornton, positive social change agent pro. Buddy Thornton, please say hello to the people. Well, good evening, everybody, and this is going to be a very special night. I always enjoy spending time with my brother Isaiah, and I believe that tonight's topic is fantastic. This is rich. This conversation to me is so rich. How do you incorporate? I'm gonna use this word reflections. Reflections. How do you incorporate reflections into your teaching practices? Because you you travel around the countryside and you teach and you speak. And and listen out, she's always open to get uh, more speaking engagements. He'll work with you on the price. <laughs> but as as he goes around, he goes, and I, I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it. The last one I saw was in, that I came out to, um, I said the last one he did, the last one I came out to, uh, he was speaking in Las Vegas for a week. And so while you're creating these structures and and these outliners, I, I see the way the audience goes from emotion to emotion. And they're, what I've seen personally, I'm not saying everybody else saw this, they were eating the words as they were coming out of your mouth. Tonight's topic is, ready for this, reframing my inner perspective. In the mind of even the most skilled artists, an image can often be reframed from what the creator had in mind. It may have started as something basic, but turned into something complex after the many brush strokes from the paintbrush to the canvas. Or vice versa, something very complex and return to something simple, something simplistic. After all, art changes over time like the sun rays through the day. Art is communication in a way that takes the viewer on a journey, sometimes down memory lane. Those memories can be sad, those memories can be challenging, but the artist has a way of balancing the colors from one scene to the next and has the audience to experience a certain feeling, a certain emotion. Buddy Thornton, Positive Change Agent Pro, what came to your thoughts, especially now, coming out of COVID, the topic tonight, reframing my inner perspective? What was the first thought that came to your mind? The first thing that I thought about was how difficult it is when you repeatedly bang your head up against a wall, especially in a very challenging, stress-filled environment like COVID has forced us universally to deal with for almost three full years. There's so many ways that we have been shoved into a box. We haven't been allowed to think for ourselves, and yet being isolated means we've also not been able to seek out our support system. We had to rely on a very, very shrunken context for living, for behaving. And sometimes a lot of people, you know, their behavior started to get a little askew from where they really would prefer to be if they were in constant relationships with other people. So as we come out of COVID, the first thing I thought when you threw this topic out was, wouldn't it be nice if everybody had one of those automatic reset buttons? And tonight we're going to talk about how to make that button magically appear. Oh, absolutely. I feel so much spontaneity about tonight's topic because it's so real life. And if you, if you take the imagination that, that we have and what we saw ourselves coming into after COVID-19, and you know, we're still in it, but we saw ourselves pivoting into a digital age. Even the most experienced educators and leaders hunting for the good stuff. To me, this is like the perfect example of, of an art, of, of like an art form. Even when we talk about those artists, those famous artists like Pablo Picasso, for instance, and, and the people that go to those galleries to buy his arts, which are worth millions of dollars. Even the most experienced art connoisseurs understand the history of an art piece and how the artist uses reflections to tell that story. Whether he is painting or she is painting a picture about a person, about a place, 
about a thing, there is a detail within the artwork through moves and emotions that are raised from the tapestry of the canvas that become alive. This is why they are called master artists. Almost seemingly, you look at some art and it looks like it's living. It looks like it's a breathing organism. What has happened to us as it relates to students, as it relates to family members, as it relates to teachers, what is going to have to happen for us to hunt for the good stuff? What's going to have to happen not to overlook what we lost during COVID-19, but to elevate our way of thinking, to elevate our mm -hmm. mindsets, to elevate our relationships, to elevate our way of life, not only for us, but for our future generations moving forward. First thing that I want to make sure that we express is that children especially take their cues from the adults in the room. And for three years now, they've been bomb bombard bombarded completely with one critical message. You're falling behind. You're falling behind. You're falling behind. And they get a sense of failure, not of their making, but they get a sense of failure and impending doom because they hear the same message repeated over and over and over. But that, re that message does not include a critical component. And that critical component is, this is a global pandemic. There is no one who hasn't fallen behind. So from a sports analogy, when everybody has to move the starting line from 100 yards to 200 yards and then start the race over again, regardless of the disadvantage of that extra 100 yards, as long as everyone has to endure the same disadvantage, that disadvantage disappears off the table. Everything becomes equal again. So if the kids in our world have to face one reality, yes, maybe they're a little behind the expectations they may have had before COVID became a reality, they can take some level of comfort in understanding that there is no one who was shielded from COVID to the level that they could have a built-in advantage. So parents, teachers, counselors, caregivers, community leaders need to quit repeating the refrain of, oh, we can't let these kids fall behind. We can't let these kids fall behind. Fall behind what? Every pandemic in history has suffered the same fate. And humanity is still here. We're still marching through time. So tell these kids, everyone's in the same boat with you. Grab an oar and start rowing. That's the absolute best thing you can do to start on your way to recovery because you want you and everyone around you to recover. You don't want this to be a solitary journey. So, yes, stop embedding the negative into the psyche of these kids and start building a path to resolution, grit, determination, and persistence. Now, Buddy Thornton, Puzzle Change Changer Pro, that was perfect what you said. And and it made me think about recalibrate. I've been hearing that word tossed around so much on social media and discussions. This is a new horizon. This is a, a place we've never been before. And to recalibrate means to bring you back to ground zero. We are reconstructing or we are remodeling to something totally different, something totally new, totally new content is being developed. We're talking right now, this podcast is being translated in different languages across the globe. And this type of communication was not possible 50 years ago. So this is something totally different. We are, we are, we are now communicating globally in a global society where people have the same way of life. Where are, where are we going as a culture, as a society? Where are we going? And I think that question is important and it's prevalent because I think we need to understand where we're headed in order for us to reframe our way of thinking. 
Well, I think what we need to do is we need to take a look at a couple of metaphors from history. Uh, I had a mentor who once told me that the worst thing you can do when you're in stress or when you find a challenging situation is to stumble around in the dark and just wonder where exactly you're going to need to go. When the best thing that could happen to you would be for, to completely fall flat on your face and have to stop moving, get up, and get your bearings and realize, oh, that's where I need to go. Another metaphor comes from horse racing, and then another metaphor comes from the Olympics back in the 60s. When a horse is struggling in the pack, the jockey often moves them to outside lanes because that's where they get fresh dirt, fresh turf, and all of a sudden they have firm footing, and they can just fly like the wind. Back in the 60s, uh, an Olympic marathon runner, think about this, a marathon runner after 26 miles of running, stumbled when he ran into the stadium, and he was a fair distance behind the leader. But he got up, brushed himself off, and then he sprinted with renewed vigor to win at least 20 yards ahead of his competitor because he got his bearings. It woke him back up from the stupor of half, after having run 26 miles. And that's where society is today. For years and years and for decades, people have been complaining. You know, the education system is in, in bad shape. There's a lot of things going on that we really don't like. COVID came along and a broken system became a non-system. And the new system, the, the requirement of switching to the digital space confounded a lot of parents, confounded a lot of community leaders. But you know who it didn't confound? It didn't confound the students who were compelled to learn. Now, there were a lot of students who decided to play video games or ignore the online platform completely. So the skewed statistics coming out of COVID are that the children, as in mass, are way behind the curve. But guess what? The students who were compelled to learn, the stars and the superstars that you really don't need to guide into the right place, they excelled. It didn't matter if it was a digital platform. It didn't matter if they didn't have classrooms to go to. They found a way through the maze that they had to find their way through. And nothing was going to stop them from getting where they were going. <clears throat> and I think the lesson that needs to be learned is Let's take a firm look at how the superstars adopt to the new innovation, the new dynamic, the hybrid and the digital learning platform. And let's realize that if we have to look in the mirror and say, we've been saying for 30, 40 years, the education system is broken. Why would we want to say the digital platforms failed the kids? No, the kids failed the digital platform. Let's take our lessons from the people who succeeded. You never follow someone who failed. If you go into business and your business model is after someone who failed, you're going to fail. So the same thing in education. Model the system after those who found success and move forward. Don't go back and adopt a broken system, a failed system that everyone knows was a failed system. And that's really where we need to be. You need to reframe your perspective to be how am I going to follow the superstars and how am I going to avoid following those who either ignored what was in front of them or made bad choices? What you said was so artistic. It was so artistic in a way that as you were talking, I, I was seeing, I was seeing pictures. I, I was seeing images. I was seeing photos and, and portraits much like art. I'm just going to say it like this. Teaching is art. I believe it. A lot of people say teaching is science, but I think it's, I think it's art as well. Pablo Picasso said this. The purpose of art is washing the dust of daily life off our souls. Because art is a great status symbol, especially in the modern society. Let me ask you a question. Buddy Thornton, Post Social Change Agent Pro. But before I do, what you got going on currently? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, you know, uh, last uh, last year in 2022, I published four books in my Slippery Slope series, and they all became international bestsellers. And I am about halfway through writing book five, which I believe is obviously going to follow in their footsteps. And I've had a lot of encouraging uh, feedback from readers and from other peers who have told me that the direction I'm taking the Slippery Slope series is a very accurate portrayal of what modernity looks like. Because a lot of people who write about ethics, my first book, or morals, my second book, they concentrate on history and philosophers, and they concentrate on what was and how should we model our behavior. Whereas my books focused on the soul, the impact of contemporary behavior. You know, we can learn from the history lessons, but we cannot live the history lessons, or we're doomed to be in history tied to their failures as well as their successes. The only way to get to the successful side is to start in modernity and continue to look forward. We don't need the lessons of the past. We're an embodiment of the lessons of the past. So when I write, and it's something I love to do more than probably anything else I do, uh, my focus is on leaning toward that positive future, and that's why I'm branded the way I am. So, yeah, and uh, speaking engagements, other things are coming up on the horizon. So I'm excited about the future, I say. It's just it's really special. I didn't realize how much getting out and busting through that uh, veil of uh, just stress and, and overwhelming uh, pain that COVID caused would allow me to just feel like I've freed myself to really be who I think the, the society needs me to be. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. As, as you were talking, I, I want to go back to um, uh, the art form. But before I do, I just want to express my you know, excitement for you, my gratitude uh, for having you on the podcast. And I just want to celebrate all the things that you're doing and, and how uh, the creator is using you to, to create, to be creative, right? <clears throat> now, let me go here because we're turning your attention toward yourself and feeling those challenges to be creative, feeling those challenges to use your imagination. Sometimes people get stuck. Sometimes people begin to compare themselves with other people and then they get lost in the sauce, if it would. And compare themselves and they say, well, I'm not Tiger Woods, right? I'm not Larry Bird. I'm not Mike, Michael Jordan. I'm not Mike Tyson. I'm not, you know, one of these great people out there. And they compare themselves and they totally miss out on who they are. And they get stuck and then time goes by. And then before you know it, 10 years have gone and they're still stuck. Now, as a positive social change agent pro, one of your skill tests is to get people unstuck. I've seen you do this in classrooms. I've seen you do it at conferences where we were in Las Vegas and you were talking to world renowned athletes and gave them the tools to get unstuck. What are some simple ways that you can tell a listening audience that would help them, that would guide them along the way, that will help them navigate to a place of peace and wholeness, especially now when there is so much, so much confusion and turmoil in the world today? What are your thoughts? First, I think that some people found the pandemic to be a panacea because they got to experience the power of being alone. You know, a lot of people hate being alone, but that's because they're afraid to look in the mirror, Isaiah. The best way and the simplest way to navigate to a place of peace and wholeness is to accept who you are in the right now. You know, life comes at you with who, what, when, where, and they're just set pieces. You really don't control some of them, and you control the others 
but they're really just a, a side rail. They're not even a consideration. We live our life in the how and the why. If we, we, we wonder how we're going to do something, we need to know why we're going to do it to be motivated to do it in the first place. You know, the question is, why am I in pain? And what do I have to do? How can I break the chain? You know, there's very importantness to that. And I think a lot of it starts with getting over the fear of having to face yourself, being alone, because being alone means you've got time for introspection. For me, I teach people how to compartmentalize themselves and start self-reflecting and be willing to accept whatever they find. You know, the very first key is being honest about yourself. If you're honest about yourself, myself, I tell people, I'm a, I have a face made for radio. I'm no Brad Pitt. But then the other side of me says, yeah, but guess what? Brad Pitt's not you. You've got attributes. You've got skills that he doesn't have. So give yourself a break. Give yourself a little time to enjoy being who you are, which means the second step is embracing your own self-worth. Regardless of where you are on the pecking order, it doesn't matter where you are on the pecking order. You have self-worth. The fact that you are alive, you are being, not doing, not achieving, but just the fact that you are existing. God put you here. Doesn't matter what your origin story is. Doesn't matter what your backstory is. You have value because you exist in your being. So embrace your self-worth for all you got. But now, <clears throat> you can't have too big of a head. You got to set some limits and then you have to honor those limits. You can't set goals that are unachievable. You have to set short goals that are achievable. And over time, you may get to where you can reach those presently unachievable goals, but you have to stay within the limitations. And you have absolutely to stop comparing yourself to anybody else except yourself. You know, as a prior professional athlete, I know that the only measuring stick I have is my prior self. If I start ruminating on whether I can beat so-and-so or they can beat me, I'll go crazy trying to make myself something I'm not. But if I simply worry about yesterday I was here, I just want to get to this next rung on the ladder. What do I have to do to achieve that? And just by the organic gift of growth, I'm going to become more competitive and I'm going to be a better human being. So you just have to uh, uh, accept that. You have to be fair. Don't, be, don't drive expectations you can't achieve. But that also means being fair with yourself means you have to be fully aware of your bad, your good, and you have to measure the bad and the good. And you have to look at where you can improve, you know, and the way you do that is you set those short-term goals. And if something's not working and you're just not making progress, it's okay to get a mentor or ask a coach to get you around a curve or over a barrier, but never change the goal. Change the process. Change the path. Make a choice. When you're climbing a tree, the goal is to get to the top of the tree, but literally there are thousands of ways to climb that tree. Would you not agree? I'm sure you would. So it's all about mindset. If they start with self-reflection and they work about being honest with themselves, good, bad, and different makes absolutely no difference. The mindset becomes succeed or learn. The only way you fail is to quit. And nobody's going to quit. I'm not going to quit. I know you're not going to quit. I've seen it over the years. When we run into a barrier, what do we do? We get with peers and we say, I'm facing a problem. How am I going to get around it? And when they give us that little hint that opens up that door, boom, we're through that door in a heartbeat. And that's the power that we have that we can give to other people, how to get to peace and then focus on those short-term goals and then keep moving one foot forward at a time. Powerful. Okay, see, now you get me on the edge of my seat, as you can see that. What you said reminded me of a game of chess. And I'm going to be honest with you. I used to love playing chess. I used to play it all the time. I haven't played it in years. But three things that you said reminded me of chess. Because chess is a purposeful. You got to. 
the strategy has to be purposeful. You have to try to uh, gain advantage over your opponent. Not like tactics, but by using strategy. And you cannot think short term. You have to think long term goals while keeping your king safe. I think the king represents your mind. I think sometimes you have to put puns in front of you as it relates to your mind. And I believe those puns represent those short term goals that they get accomplished to protect the long term goals so that you can build your strategy. And sometimes your small term goals, your, your small term goals don't work. And then you, you, okay, you lost a little time. And so you regroup. But how did you get to that part? How did you get to, I know experience, but how did you get to a place where you learned to use strategy instead of emotion? That's my next question for you. Well, you know, trial and error is one thing, but understanding the value of time is another. You know, nothing on this planet is more valuable than the time that we're given. Because when you're born, if you just look at the average, you know, you have less than 80 years to get down the road and get where you're going to get. And every day, every week, every year that you waste after you get through your development phase is something you choose to waste. It's not because other people force you to waste it. Regardless of what barriers are placed in front of you, you have a choice of how to get around that barrier. And if you don't believe you have the skill set to get around that barrier, you should swallow your ego and you should ask a mentor or someone to help you get around that barrier. There's no shame in getting help. I was an athlete for 27 years. I never went one year without a coach. I always had a coach. And they, the one thing they always told me is, you know what, if what you're doing isn't working to your satisfaction, you still need to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Work until you find a better way or find someone who has a better way and either mimic them or ask them to teach you the better way. That shortens the curve and it gets you where you are. You have to have a mindset that you're never so good that you can't learn from someone else. And that probably is the most critical aspect of getting where you are and how to find peace in your imperfection. Amazing. A, a lot of guests that have been on the podcast have talked about many, most of the guests, to be honest with you, have talked about those daily affirmations, those daily affirmations, along with the goal setting. How important is practicing positive affirmations? Do you do it? I know you do, but do you do it? And if you do, why are they so important? as it relates to your goals, as it relates to your interaction with family, friends, colleagues, business, and why, and, and how can people form those habits and, and train their minds to start doing those daily affirmations? I, I'm talking about with students. I'm talking about uh, teachers, leaders. What's your thoughts about that? Well, we have to go back to human biology and understand how the, human brain works. And I leverage that. It took me years and years and reading a lot of books and a lot of research articles and talking to people who were successful people to ask them, you know, I know you love this book. Uh, I know you love that book. I know you love this mentor, this author. Tell me why it's so important. And over the years, these are the two things that I learned. Before you go to bed in the evening, You need to think about the one or two things that are problematic that you're going to need to want to solve. And then you need to counterbalance that with what were your two or three successes from the previous day? Where were your, where were your challenges met? Where did you amaze somebody else or where did somebody else amaze you? 
the trip upward is not always you. It's sometimes you just see somebody else do something and you go, wow, that was amazing. And because your brain got to absorb that, now it's going to be embedded in there. But here's the trick. You need to do a mindset reset right before you go to bed. What are the two things I'm going to want to focus on tomorrow? And what were my best successes today? And this is what's happening. When you're sleeping, your mind is filing things away and they're prioritizing because they are you. Your brain is you. You allow your subconscious ability to set the path forward, happen organically. And when you get up the next morning, you don't get up groggy. You don't get up disoriented. What you do is you get up and you spend the first 15, 20 minutes just allowing your mind to set you up for the day. Some people take walks. I like to really just have a conversation with myself about, you know, it's not important to grab my phone. It's not important to throw on my clothes and jump out the door. What's important is making sure that I have the right mindset to achieve the things that I went to bed, allowing my brain to organize. And amazingly, I would say well over 95% of the time, you already know the things that you're going to get to accomplish today. And guess what? Over time, you learn how to predict those successes that you're going to get to celebrate before you go to sleep at night. And that's exactly what I do. Every day, seven days a week, it doesn't matter. I thank God for putting me where I can have the little successes. And I ask God for permission to conquer what's facing me the next day. I believe when you're resilient, you can embrace your weaknesses and not avoid them. And you can look for ways it, of managing those. Go ahead. Well, I just want to give you a, a mental picture. And I, I think the audience will really appreciate this mental picture. If the last thing you do before you climb into bed or lay down to go to sleep is ruminate or think about the challenges that are in front of you, they're really that little chip on your shoulder that you just weren't able to knock off. And just imagine, just close your eyes and just imagine you wake up the next morning and there's a giant oak planted on your shoulder. Because your brain is going to work on the last thing that you put in it all night long. It's, it's going to reorganize, but it's going to reorganize based on what's going to be the first thing that you need to do the next day. And that little chip becomes this huge giant tree that you're now you're going to have to chop it down, not just thump it off your shoulder. And wouldn't it be better if the last thing you did before you laid down at night is think about the gifts that you were given that were placed in your hands by your creator, by your friends, your peers, who were put there by your creator to give you those gifts. Because if you put that in your mind as the last thing you have when you lay down, the next morning, you know what you're going to do? You're going to wake up in the hands of angels. That's really important. Amazing, 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 amazing. Let me go back to this <laughs> because this is so, so good. And again, listen, audience, you're listening to Buddy Thornton Puzzle of Change Agent Pro. And, and you see why he's on the podcast all the time because he has a wealth, a wealth, a wealth of experience and knowledge. The topic, the topic for tonight, what's the topic for tonight? Let's see here. What is the topic for Because <laughs> I'm, I'm just lost right now in this conversation. Okay, the topic for tonight is reframing my inner perspective. And when I came up with this topic, I was thinking about artists and when they draw and they paint pictures and I thought about Pablo Picasso and I thought about when I was in college, we used to go to the art galleries and we used to walk through those art galleries. And then our professors would, would tell us, hey, close your eyes as you walk through this art gallery and see how the artists use the, what does it call it, depth perception and see how the artists use those measurements to involve an inevitable reaction or emotion. And from well, that- let me, let me- uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Let me interject one thing. I use Picasso all the time in my teaching, but let me give you a little hint about the genius behind Picasso. 
I like to tell people that you need to create your own personal Picasso, but you need to also work diligently and forever to fill in all the corners to make sure you end up with a complete picture. But that's the secret of genius in Picasso. You can go and look at any of his works throughout his entire history. Once he, you know, started writing in his style or painting in his style, what he managed to do was he managed to always leave a small portion distinctly out of focus or out of the realm of the picture. He left something for the perceiver of the art to fill in emotionally, psychologically, and abstractly in their mind. What he did was he drew people in. All of a sudden, he left you something to finish the picture. And it just really draws you in and makes you think, wow, what if I was Picasso? What would I put in that space? And it teaches you that there's always room for more. There's always room for more. And that's the gift that Pablo Picasso gave the world. How to always leave just that little small space for growth. Art is not just on display to be looked at. It is, it is there to model what greatness looks like. We're, we're role modeling to show the future leaders what it looks like what it sounds like, what it tastes like. If you're a chef, what it tastes like. If you are a clothing designer, how it should look, how it should feel, what's the texture. And much like painting, we ourselves are also masterpieces that life created, not for us to hide in the shadows of our sorrows because of what we went through, but to be on display as living examples or living epistles of role models. But in many cases, this is only achieved when we can reframe, like Buddy was just saying, what we had in mind. What portraits, what images, what photos, what snapshots, what selfies <laughs> we had in mind. How do you do it? How do you incorporate inflections into your teaching practices? That's my question. I want to start with a quote from Watterson. And I think this is an extremely good quote about reflection. He asked this very powerful question. Did you ever wonder if the person in the puddle is real and you are just its reflection? Can we ever define reality? Is reality even real? You know, the human brain doesn't get to reach out and touch things. It has to experience them through the senses. And so, do we ever really know, are we the reality or is what we're seeing the reality and we are simply being reflected out of the glass or out of the surface of the water? You know, and the question, obviously, especially when you're trying to get people to look at the good, the bad, everything that's around them, you have to start with what is reality. And for most people, reality is pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. And they do it because of one word, fear. Fear dominates the mind when it doesn't know what it is experiencing. And there's two types of fear. Rational fear is fear of something that you know is a danger. So from that perspective, it's a tangible threat. So if danger is real, then fear is necessary, but how you respond is a choice. But let's say you don't know what's around the next corner. Those little hairs on the back of your neck are standing up. You've got this little cognitive dissonance going is what we call it in the trade. That's because of the unknown. And that's an irrational fear. There may not be anything around that corner. It could just be a blind alley with nobody in it. But that's an irrational fear from an ima imaginary threat. You don't know if it's there or not, but your brain doesn't know the difference. So it's going to create the fear regardless of whether there's a threat there or not. And nobody in the audience can say they haven't experienced walking down a dark street in the evening 
and coming up upon a blind alley without feeling like they need to just take that tiny little glance into that alley just to make sure that their fear has been conquered and they change the irrational fear to a rational fear and then they can put it aside. They can choose to put it aside. You know, sometimes the truth is what we run into when we need it the most. We run from the truth when we don't want to face the truth. But sometimes when we get that urge to run, what we need to do is run toward the truth as fast as we can and stop avoiding it. That's what it takes to start reflecting and getting rid of the bad and conquering it with the good. The act of going within, finding the truth, embracing it, and then sharing it helps far more than any human being could ever know. You have to be able to embrace the truth, whether it hurts you, helps you, makes you look bad, makes you look good. It is a starting point. It's a grounding point. It puts your feet squarely on the ground and you know exactly where you need to go. You either need to change what you're doing or you need to embrace and sustain what you're doing. Those are the two things you have. But I have to, I have to really encapsulate that. In the sporting world, you're never as good as you think you are. Somebody is always better. When you're having a bad day, you're never as bad as you think you are. Somebody could be having a far worse day. It's belief leading to action. If you believe you're not worthy, you will never be worthy. Your reflection of your belief turns into your reality. What we actually do becomes not only a reflection, but a reality of our beliefs. So if you don't like what you're manifesting, the first thing you need to do is examine your beliefs. Because if you're in a bad place, it's because your beliefs put you there. Hot off the press. Life, nature, belief, reflection, complexity, creativity are all universal truths. We're out of time. But before we go, what takeaway, Buddy Thornton, Positive Change Agent Pro, would you like to lead the audience with? I believe that everybody needs to understand that when you're looking within yourself, you have a lot more information than any other human being on the planet. You know your origin story. You know your backstory. You know those painful moments. You know the things that you did to conquer them, or you know the people who enabled you to conquer them, the people you owe so much to. But when you look at other people, you can't help but wonder how much you could help them if you knew their origin story, if you knew their backstory, if you knew their pain, if you knew what really made them happy, if you knew what tickled their pleasure bone. You have to understand that you need to take care of you. Like they say on the airplane, if the mask drops, put it on your own face first before you try to help the person next to you. You have to believe in your heart and your soul that you build the world from the inside out. You can't manipulate other people. You can only make choices based on you. You have no right to dictate the choices of others. So if everybody in the listening audience, if everybody worked on making that one little change every day, take the inchworm approach. I just want to gain that extra little half inch today. I just want to get that little half inch better today so that tomorrow I can look for the next little half inch and start not worrying about what other people are doing, saying, thinking, their opinions. You know what? The world would right its ship. We would actually be able to move forward in a much more positive way. And I just believe that humanity has lost that recipe for success. I think we really need to embrace the recipe for success which is build it from within, strengthen your belief system, and understand that everything you do, every act you make, and every success you have is anchored in your beliefs. 
This has been another impactful night. An impact education leadership. Good night. Impact of educational leadership podcast. Facebook.